Chapter 3. Some Crops Are More Sensitive to Calcium Needs Calcium in relation to toxicity of sprays and fumigants in contact with the foliage. The importance of calcium in building up protoplasm resistance to the toxicity associated with certain sprays and fumigants and its relation to the killing effects of herbicides are too often overlooked. The following story emphasizes the importance of people with different training working together. The importance of pulverized limestone in the soil to general welfare of cucumbers, as previously mentioned, was of much concern to the owners of a cucumber-producing greenhouse plant in Barberton, Ohio, who prompted me to initiate several pot experiments. The soil was known to have a high pH of 8.4, with a very low reading of available calcium. I want to give much credit to Dr. Barnes and Dr. Bradfield, who were with Ohio State University at the time, 1932 to 1934, for their stimulating ideas and discussions helped me greatly in formulating these experiments. The high pH of the soil, along with a very low available calcium reading, were difficult to understand in terms of our ideas on the reliability of the soil acidity test in determining lime needs of the soil. The potassium content of the greenhouse soils was very high due to excessive applications of muriate of potash, a ton to the acre having been applied every year. This undoubtedly had much to do with upsetting the soil nutrient levels. Much of the calcium leached away as calcium chloride. To set up the experiment, 10-quart tubs were filled with soil and were separately treated with different amounts of pulverized limestone. Successive tubs, except the check received the equivalent of 400, 800, 1200, 1600, 2000, 2400, 2800, 3200, and 3600 pounds of calcium per acre. Each tub treatment was repeated four times. Individual cucumber plants were grown in each tub and supported on strings hanging from a wire eight feet above the tubs. There were differences in rate of growth from the check plants, which grew slowly, to those receiving 2,800 pounds of calcium, which grew more rapidly. Beyond that, there was little difference in the rate of growth. When the first plants reached the overhead wire, some of the margins of the older leaves on all plants which received less than 1,600 pounds of calcium per acre began to turn yellow and die. The marginal burning is often mistaken for potassium deficiency. When the plant had cucumbers ready to pick sulfur dioxide from sulfur, which had accumulated on a six-inch mainline steam pipe, which used, was used once a year to carry steam for soil sterilization to a greenhouse beyond, was accidentally released in the compartment. The next day, many of the plants were entirely dead, whereas those receiving 2,800 pounds or more of calcium showed no noticeable injury. When the damage was evaluated, all the plants receiving 1,600 pounds of calcium per acre or less were dead. Those in the tubs, having between 1,600 and 3,200 pounds, exhibited considerable damage to the older leaves. The results are shown in the accompanying figures. Apparently, the injury was indirectly correlated with the amount of available calcium in the soil. Several years later, I was discussing this with Mr. Fuller who marketed the Fuller method of greenhouse fumigation to kill mites on flowering plants. He said he could not understand why his method seemed perfectly safe in some houses, while in others it did considerable damage. As he thought about it, he said he had no difficulty in well-managed houses. Injury occurred in badly managed greenhouses. I related my experience with cucumbers and told him to check on the available calcium in the soil. Perhaps he could find the answer. Several years later, he told me he had restricted his fumigation to greenhouses that were well managed and where applications of pulverized limestone had been made. In 1934, after I returned to New Jersey and started a research program on soil fertility problems, I reported results on a pH available calcium problem in soil science. We were finding many similar cases in sandy loam soils due to excessive uses of nitrate of soda in the production of vegetable crops. During the next 20 years, I ran into this same problem in many different areas east of the Mississippi River.
Some six years after I had the experience with the cucumbers, I was asked to work on a cooperative project where arsenic injury was being studied on fruit trees in New Jersey. The leaves on these apple trees had turned yellow and dropped off. At about the same time, the fruit was half grown wherever arsenate of lead had been used for the control of worms in the fruit. Well, eventually, the leaves showed many naked branches with only two or three leaves on the tip. This condition was not unlike the symptoms of magnesium deficiency on apple trees. In the following year or two, the trees did not set fruit, and some of them died. Since arsenate of lead was a common spray ingredient, and since the foliage turned yellow at about the same time arsenate of lead was used in the spray, this ingredient was viewed with suspicion. And chemical studies were started to find out how the arsenate of lead was causing the injury. It seemed that the injury occurred a week or two after the spray was applied. It followed the pattern of a systemic disease, no burning or immediate injury, but a gradual fading of the green color and abscission of the leaf. After six years of study, trying to find out how arsenate of lead was doing the damage, we felt we were up against a stone wall. Nothing definite had been learned. At this time, it was decided that the assistant extension specialist in horticulture, Mr. Harold Robertson, and I were to make a survey of the orchards and find out how widespread this damage really was and whether we could find some correlations in the field. From my previous experience, I was prompted to take a portable acidity tester with me. After visiting at random 10 orchards, all of which were being sprayed with arsenate of lead, we found orchards ranging in injury from those in which trees were in poor growth, with some trees dying, to orchards which were in perfect condition and yielding heavy crops of fruit. It was also noticeable that there were trees that were badly damaged. Cover crops would not grow very well under the trees. It was evident that arsenate of lead was not the real cause, although it did not eliminate the possibility of some indirect effect since we found no orchards where arsenate of lead had not been used. We decided to investigate one of the most badly damaged orchards, which happened to belong to Paul Burke on Rancocos Creek in Camden County, New Jersey. We found him very cooperative and anxious to work with us. I must digress for a moment to give some background information because sociological factors are sometimes tied in with cultural practices. To my way of thinking, Paul Burke was a gentleman fruit grower. He worked very closely with experiment station people, read, in addition to other things, everything he could find on fruit culture, and tried to do the right thing. He and his wife lived in one of the beautiful old homes in New Jersey, surrounded by antique furnishings, which would do credit to many museums. Their family consisted of three sons, two in college and the third getting ready to attend Cornell University. The eldest son had attended the University of Pennsylvania and was the current Olympic sculling champion. Everyone worked, and it was very discouraging to see acres and acres of orchards gradually dying, apparently in spite of following recommended practices. As we walked through the orchards and saw the poor crops, our conversation revolved around the idea that a good crop of apples on such a fruit farm should pay the expenses necessary to assure three boys a college education, whereas a poor crop could actually just be an additional expense. I resolved that I was going to solve Mr. Burke's problem if it was the last thing I ever did. I asked Paul what the lime condition in his soil was, and he said the pH was satisfactory, 6.4 to 6.8. The soil was a loamy sand and had produced exceptionally fine fruit in past years. As he walked through the orchard, we found spots near trees where some sweet clover plants were growing two feet tall. I grabbed a plant and was surprised that it could be pulled up with very little effort. When I examined the roots, I found that the tap root had grown one inch and had been divided so that it resembled an inverted Y, with the branch roots all growing parallel to the surface of the soil at the one-inch depth. Mr. Burke told us he had applied two tons of limestone per acre before the sweet clover was sown. He had disked the limestone into the ground. I got my acidity tester and checked the pH and found the soil tested 
Paul said my soil tester was wrong and that he had tested the soil with his tester and it was 6.4. Then I took a sample of the surface inch of soil and we got both 6.4 as our reading. The limestone was all in the surface. When he told me that he had run the disc harrow eight inches deep to mix the limestone with the soil, I told him he used the wrong tool to do the job. We secured a shovel and started digging holes around the trees. All the older roots had sent feeder roots up to the surface inch of the soil. Every time we disked the soil, we cut off all the feeding roots. We realized that the trees were starving. We used sulfate of ammonia as his nitrogen fertilizer. This was making the soil more acid. When we realized that the problem seemed to be associated with a lime deficiency in the subsoil, we suggested that he apply limestone, two tons to the acre, plow it under, and put two tons on after the ground was plowed, up close to the trees where he could not plow. We suggested that he spread six to eight shovels of limestone. He was worried about cutting off the roots when he plowed the ground. I told him it would not be any worse than cutting them off with the disc harrow. Several months after he applied the limestone, we dug holes around the trees again and found the soil full of feeding roots. That late summer, I left Rutgers University, and I did not see this orchard for three years. When I did see the orchard again, it was producing a fine crop of fruit. I could hardly believe that this was the same orchard, and Mr. Burke informed me that he was still using arsenate of lead. A number of years later, I had occasion to work with a peach grower in one of the southern states along the Atlantic seacoast. This grower had 60 acres of fruit. When I first visited this orchard, the grower was alarmed about the growth condition of his trees, particularly since he had been told he was not in a peach growing area and that weather conditions and spray materials were responsible for the sickly appearance of some of his trees just when they were beginning to produce fruit. As we walked through the orchard, he pointed out trees that were showing signs of injury. When I asked him whether he had used limestone on his soils, he informed me that he had been warned by his college advisors that he should not use it and that it might ruin the orchard. When I told him he would lose a number of his trees if he did not put on limestone, he started an argument. I told him I wasn't interested in arguing, but that if he was willing to put on three to four tons of limestone per acre around some of his sick trees, I was sure the trees would be revived. Well, when he saw how much good the limestone did for these trees, he put limestone on all the trees. After that, he had vigorously growing trees that yielded quantities of high-quality fruit. The college advisor still warns him against using limestone on peaches. The grower, for some reason, did not tell him about his putting on the limestone. The human equation is hard to understand at times. It seems as though every time I mention limestone to a grower, he tells me that he has been warned by his county agriculture agent not to use limestone. A number of years ago, I told a spinach grower that his problems were due to insufficient lime in his soil, and he told me that his county agent had told him to be careful not to overlime. I set up some plots applying two, four, six, and eight tons of limestone per acre. I found out later that several people from the experiment station had taken pictures of the plots because they were sure that I would overlime the soil. The grower told me that when the spinach on the eight ton plots began to grow better than the other plots, they stopped taking pictures. The plot outyielded the others. I couldn't understand why they weren't interested in growing better spinach and why they didn't take pictures up to harvest. Their attitude seemed to be to try to prevent growers from growing better crops rather than to help the farmer do a better job. It was a case where the book could not be wrong. We have too much of a negative approach to our fertility problems. A lot of research people, I should label them testers, seem to try to disprove anything that is new. They make up their minds that the new idea is wrong and won't work, and then they try to prove it. And if they can't prove it is wrong, they blame the weather. They would do the farmer much more good if they would approach a problem humbly and open-mindedly and reserve their final opinions until all the evidence was in. I have heard agricultural research people criticize people engaged in fundamental research in other fields as being long-haired and too impractical or so technical that nobody could understand them. I immediately classify such a person as ignorant or too lazy to try to understand. 
It is my candid opinion that our agricultural problem, if there is one, can only be solved by men who are steeped in fundamental research. There is no place for the politician in this picture. A farmer, to maintain a satisfactory standard of living, must look to the fundamental research man for guidance. Superficial thinking is responsible for low average yields, which can only lead to a low standard of living. The picture is not a pretty one, and our extension service setup must assume a lot of the responsibility for making the picture as dark as it is. Agriculture is a complicated business. It is 100% a chemical phenomenon, and it takes chemical knowledge to understand it. We find farmers who are doing an exceptionally good job, who have no chemical training, but for every one like that, there are ten or more who are barely existing. To them, chemistry is bunk. I knew a college professor who, when confronted by some statement he could not understand, turned it aside by saying, it's the bunk. He even wrote a book, which was a repetition of what others had written before him in other books. People with such points of view should not be in a position where they can teach others. They are responsible for so much of the agricultural misinformation that is disseminated for the farmer's use. It will be corrected eventually, but in the meantime, many farmers will lose their farms. The amount of calcium in the soil and the growth of cucumbers, tomatoes, and celeries in a greenhouse, and celery and horseradish in the field. During the early 30s, I was employed by a large greenhouse grower in the Akron area to help him find out why cucumbers and tomatoes were growing so poorly with what seemed like ample fertilizer. The cucumbers grew to the wires six feet above the ground, with much yellowing at the older foliage, which soon caused premature drying of the old leaves and much malformation of the fruit. Diseases seemed to be prevalent in abundance. There were many nubbins, mature cucumbers not over three inches long. By this time, the growing tips showed symptoms of mosaic. The tomato plants seemed to grow freely enough, but they did not set fruit readily, and much of the fruit that did set developed into rough, misshapen specimens. The leaves showed many chlorotic areas and premature drying of the older leaves. An examination of the foliage with tests applied while examining leaves under the microscope showed a large amount of potassium, but no available calcium crystals. When we examined the soil, there was no available calcium. However, the pH of the soil was above 8.0. The potassium was very high and the phosphorus was low. A situation existed here which was contrary to general knowledge, a pH above the neutral point, but a negative test for calcium. The soil indicated a highly dispersed physical condition, very slippery and slimy when it was wet, and baking as hard as a brick when it was dry. The soil between the rows, where there was much traffic, was as hard and smooth as an asphalt highway. When it was worked between crops, it was hard and lumpy. It was very difficult to steam sterilize the soil because of this lumpy condition. It happened that a Dr. Doolittle from the USDA Department of Plant Pathology stopped by about this time, so I had a chance to discover our mosaic problem with him. When he looked at the plants, he asked, Why are you applying so much potash? I told him I was unaware of any heavy applications of potash having been made. However, this agreed with the microscopic examination I had made previously. When we inquired about this from the grower, he said he had applied a ton of muriate of potash per acre before each crop of cucumbers, because he had been advised that if you wanted to grow high-quality cucumbers, you needed an abundance of potassium. He further informed us that the first time they used it, the cucumbers were definitely better than the previous crop, but that after that succeeding crops were not of high quality. I assumed from this that the potash had made available through displacement liberal quantities of calcium the first few times it was used, and that succeeding applications released less and less calcium which was not sufficient to balance the liberal quantities of potassium in the soil. This also could account for the high pH because of the greater activity of the potassium ion. In other words, with no available calcium in the soil, the plants absorbed potassium in large quantities. There apparently was so little calcium and so much potash that the plants looked as though they had a disease. The soil, normally a good silt loam, was hard. Limestone could soften this soil but the pH was above 8. I immediately got some of this soil into the laboratory, mixed it thoroughly, 
divided it into four lots, and filled eight-inch pots with it. One lot I put in pots with no additional treatment for a check. I have seen this happen on numerous occasions. I have recommended three to eight tons of limestone per acre on soils that had neutral pH but very little available calcium, and have had the growers call me and ask why their pH dropped to 6.2. They were always ready to condemn the limestone, but when we checked the soil for calcium, we found it adequate for the soil type. I must warn anyone who conducts these tests that the pH will vary from 6 to 7 during a 12-month period. Soluble salts tend to move up and down in the soil, depending on its moisture content. During the summer, except after very heavy rains, soluble salts may be very high in the surface inch of soil. During the winter, these salts are very low, accompanied by some leaching. During the summer, loss of nutrients occurs mostly from surface runoff. The soluble salts in the surface usually have very little calcium unless the soil is saturated with calcium. Most of the calcium probably is lost by leaching, water running out of drain tiles where large amounts of mixed fertilizer had been applied has been known to carry 40 ppm of calcium in the form of calcium chloride. When I asked the celery grower how his soil had reached this low calcium condition, he told me that the farm had originally been a potato farm, where the pH was maintained at 5.5 or less to control scab. However, the owner had found too much scab and had sold the farm. The present owner had grown a fairly good crop of celery with 150 pounds of nitrate of soda the first year. During the following years, he had found that he had to use more and more, until for the present season he applied 1,500 pounds of nitrate of soda and his celery developed calcium deficiency. My explanation to him was that the soda probably was kicking calcium out of the exchange complex until most of it was replaced by sodium. The nitrate nitrogen probably did not help the celery much. The problem, therefore, was to replace this sodium with calcium. Since the calcium requirement of this Collingdon sand loam should not be over two tons of pulverized limestone per acre foot, it should have been a simple matter to correct. However, when we went to the field with the problem, we found a plow sole two to four inches thick under the plowed layer. In some cases, this was as hard as concrete. So we plowed under a ton of limestone and applied another ton on the surface and mixed it as well as we could. We worked on this problem for seven years, during which time we had applied six tons of pulverized limestone per acre and our celery still suffered from what seemed like calcium deficiency. I finally asked Dr. Jaffe from the soils department at Rutgers to work with me on this problem. He very carefully examined the soil profile to a depth of four feet, tested various layers, and, after some calculations, told the grower he probably would need another six tons of limestone. He found later that the irrigation water, which came from a 300-foot, 10-inch well, contained an appreciable amount of sodium chloride. A new well was drilled 100 feet deep to give salt-free water. Nevertheless, applications of limestone gave a definite boost to the celery for several years after this. During this trial period, a smaller field where he grew plants developed calcium deficiency. When the plants were four inches tall, the hearts died out, very much as they would do with boron deficiency. A heavy application of pulverized limestone was applied broadcast over the plants. Four rows of plants were left without limestone for a check. The hearts of these plants and the older leaves made no further growth. Those that received the limestone recovered and made a normal growth. The grower told me he could see an improvement 24 hours after the limestone was applied. I have used this same treatment on spinach with equally good results. Even though this grower did grow some very good celery during the years we worked with him, it was necessary to apply some limestone every year to maintain a healthy growing crop. It seemed very difficult to kick the sodium out of the colloidal complex. My experience in later years convinced me that if we had applied four to six tons of calcium limestone per acre, along with some gypsum, and had mixed it with the soil through the use of a rototiller set deep enough to break up the plow sole, 
we might have seen a permanent correction in two years. As it is, after some 20 years, the grower is still having a problem, but it is easily corrected with a ton of limestone.